morning. Welcome to today's webinar. Heat transfer in stirred tanks, designing with tank jackets and or internal heat transfer coils. My name is Richard Cope. I will be the host today. I am a senior process consulting engineer here at SPX Flow. I've been with SPX Flow since 2020. Prior to that, I worked with the Dow Chemical Company, Eli Lilly, and Alchemies. I've worked on a broad spectrum of chemical engineering processes. I've contributed to a number of publications, hold seven U.S. world patents, including one for the award-winning KT3 Tickler, which is offered by SPX Flow at the Lighten brand. My goal today is for everyone participating to learn something new about mixing technology as related to heat transfer surfaces. And to better understand how any of our mixing brands, any of the SPX flow brands, might help in your role in your application. Maybe what I say directly won't be something that you remember, but if my comments trigger some beneficial thinking on your part, then I'll feel that my presentation has been successful. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. As an audience member, you will not have audio or visual capability. Please use your Q&A feature to submit any questions throughout the presentation, and I will answer as many as I can at the end. If time doesn't allow me to answer all, my contact information will be provided during the Q&A so that you as a participant can follow up with me as needed. My team will distribute a brief survey after the presentation with a copy of this recording, and we would appreciate your participation and feedback. So let's get started with our discussion, heat transfer in stirred tanks. This is what I'd like to cover in the next, say, 45 minutes. I'll briefly introduce SPX flow. Then I'd like to jump right into the technical aspects of heat transfer in stirred tanks. This is meant to be a technical session, so I will present working information, experimental methods, et cetera, and some up-to-date correlations. This particular area of uh, mixing research, heat transfer, has not received a great deal of attention of late, but it's good to review what has been done, do a refresh, et cetera. So that, again, is what we hope to be doing today. SPX Flow Mixing Solutions is a global organization, the largest industrial mixing company in the world. We have five different mixing brands under our corporate umbrella. They include Lightning, Philadelphia, Plenty, Stelzer, and U-Technique. These brands represent a broad range of mixing applications across the process industries, including chemicals, uh, minerals and mining, biotech, paints, coatings, nutrition, health, ag, uh, water treatment, I mean, any number. We have four labs around the world where we do fundamental research to develop new mixing technologies, but more typically, we carry out targeted testing to improve customer processes. So let's talk a little bit about utilizing heat transfer in a mixing vessel. Uh, a properly designed mixing vessel will successfully utilize heat transfer to reach some desired temperature within an allotted time. There are potential limitations. For example, uh, if you have a low process flow across your heat transfer surface, that will be an issue. Perhaps you don't have adequate surface area. Maybe you're getting non-uniform temperatures within the batch because there's problems with the mixing or the flow itself, uh, missing zones, or perhaps you're just not utilizing the available heat transfer that you have. Um, there could be issues, for example, with the flow of the fluid based on the way you've set up your, your heat transfer areas. These are all things that we would like to talk about today. This graphic shows three modes of heat transfer, namely convection, conduction, and radiation. In stirred tanks, it's the first two, convection and conduction, that are most important because radiation, we don't have any high temperatures, combustion, or flame sources, etc. So radiation is not important typically in a stirred tank. So how do we achieve and maximize heat transfer in stirred tanks? We do that by designing various heat transfer surfaces into our tanks and then optimizing their surface area and the flow across that surface area. Well, what are the types of heat transfer surfaces that are available to us in stirred tanks? Typically, there's uh, only one or two different types. One is the jacket of the vessel. So if you have a jacketed vessel, you'll have heat transfer fluid 
flowing through that jacket, which is outside of the vessel wall where your process fluid is contained. The other is internal coils that are immersed in the process fluid itself inside of the tank. A couple of pluses and minuses to these different types of systems are listed here for the external tank. You only get flow across the outside wall of your, of your jacket. Um, it's less expensive to build than internal coils, but it's also less effective. Talking about internal coils, again, they are generally more effective than the jackets. Um, the coils may act as baffles themselves, thus not requiring additional surface with um, baffles. They are more expensive than a jacket, and, and they do impact the flow inside of the vessel. Hopefully, we design it properly so that that impact is positive. So in terms of jacketed tanks, these are the four common types that we work with uh, on a regular basis. The first is just an open or a flooded tank. The second is a half pipe. Third is the dimple jacket, and the fourth is pillow plates or laser plates. Now let's take just a, a little bit of time to talk about each of these. You'll note that in each of these depictions, we have insulation around the outside of the tank. That's to keep flow from escaping to the world, excuse me, the heat from escaping to the world, but transferring into the process wood. All right, so let's discuss then the different, we'll start with an open or a flooded jacket tank. Uh, it is what you see. It's the vessel is nested inside of basically a larger vessel and the annulus between the two, that annular space, is in what you flood with your heat transfer fluid. You can uh, interact or you can implement some enhancements by putting, for example, high temperature nozzles inside of the jacket. That will give you a, a higher heat transfer coefficient due to higher velocities across the surface. You could also implement baffles, be they vertical or horizontal, to control flow to avoid short circuiting. And uh, in the well, noted below in this slide, you'll see Feldmeyer equipment and MXD process. Those are a couple of tank vendors that I was talking to about these four different jacket types. And so I'll share um, comments that I received from them. One that I'll note for these flooded or open jackets: this is the least expensive type of jacket or, or jacket and tank to purchase. They're common, for example, in rapid quench with sterilization. The next type jacket is the, the half pipe. This is basically a half pipe wound around the vessel exterior. You can see in this image dotted lines at a slant cutting across the, the vessel. That represents those half pipes themselves, different windings. Incidentally, the, the pipe cross section could be a full half pipe, 180 degrees, or it could be 120 degrees, another common shape, so about a third of the full circle in your pipe cross section. You can also get half pipes that are not circular at all. Anyway, these, the, these different geometries, your half pipe, whatever is selected, you'll then wind that around the tank at some pitch angle and then weld both sides of the tank as it goes around. Uh, obviously, the half pipe itself is flooded when you try to exchange heat. So I guess uh, you could also, I mentioned you could also get half pipes that are two systems in one where every alternate coil winding applies to a different um, heat transfer fluid. So maybe the even numbered coils are for a hot fluid and the odd number coils or odd number of windings are for a cool fluid. You obviously wouldn't flow both simultaneously, but maybe you flow the hot fluid while you're heating, then you want to suddenly quench, you stop the hot flow and immediately start flowing cold flow through the through the cold coils. Okay, just another option in your design. So there is some flexibility in these various designs. Mention as well that the half pipe is the most expensive, the most labor intensive of these four jacket types, according to the tank vendors I talked with. Um, if you have a big vessel, say it's a five meter diameter and 18, 20 meters tall, you may have more than a half mile of piping. And so that's a lot of welding and you have to do it on each side. So obviously labor intensive and, and can be expensive. Next type we'd like to discuss is a dimple jacket. The dimple jacket, um, you can vary the dimples themselves in terms of 
their geometry, their diameters, their height, et cetera. So that's the design variables you can get into. You can put jackets in the dimple. And they are somewhat labor intensive because as indicated in the image here on the left, uh, you press the dimple down into the plate and then they punch out the center, the bottom of the dimple. And as the plate is overlaid around the tank, they then weld around that circle in the middle to give them an effective seal and also to make sure that they maintain effective contact. Okay, so that, anyway, the dimple jacket itself is somewhat labor intensive. Of these two vendors, they said that it is also the most popular and most effective, they said, of the tanks that they sell. Okay, finally, the fourth type is the pillow plate or the laser plate. In this design, you actually overlay two or three whatever pieces of metal on top of each other and then you come through with a laser or a welder and you seal with a circular pattern laid out on a grid as as depicted in this image and you create these seal points this grid of seal points all across the middle then you take that metal and roll it to the shape that you need you can slap your heads on and once they're um, connected together to give you your tank vessel or your desired geometry. Then you install an inlet that allows you to force liquid in between two layers of metal and it inflates the metal. And as you see is depicted here, you end up with kind of a pillow shape. A single embossed means that one side of the metal is thicker than the other side and therefore only one side expands. If the two metals are of similar thickness, they can both expand and give you the indicated shape here. So there are design variables. Obviously, you can vary um, the embossing, single or double. You can also change the grid itself, how frequently, how big those circles are, et cetera. And then the, the amount of expansion you put into that. Obviously, this is a smaller vessel uh, volume, I guess, in the jacket, a smaller jacket volume. And so flowing the fluid, the heat transfer fluid could be higher pressure drop. Um, Anyway, this is a jacket that is popular. It's a lower cost. It gives good performance. I see even some of the pillow plate or laser plate uh, vendors that I've spoken with have said that they take a higher pressure than would a dimple jacket. Uh, these are commonly applied according to the sources I've spoken to in applications that have a fixed temperature to them, where you just introduce your fluid and it has to come to temperature and relatively quickly flows, etc. don't change in the jacket. So that is a discussion of the four types of jackets. Now, let's talk about internal coils. I'm showing two types here. The first is uh, nearly horizontal, but coiled internal coils, call them helical coils inside of your jacket. They can be a single coil that is in diameter, similar to that of the tank, obviously somewhat smaller, but larger than the impellers. Or it could be a series of smaller helical coils that are dispersed around the perimeter of the tank. I'll say the smaller coil design I haven't seen very frequently. I don't know how popular it really is, but that is obviously an option. The second type of internal coil is the vertical. And we have uh, indicated here harp coils, also a vertical plate coil. So harp coils are just a bundle of tubes. There could be multiple tubes, could be you know, five, 10, who knows more of the the tubes, individual tubes, almost like strings on a harp and extending from top to bottom, that's the name harp coils. Um, and you would disperse or distribute these bundles of harp coils around the perimeter of the tank. I'm showing also a vertical plate coil. Won't do a lot of discussion about that, but that is another option. And in that case, you would have the uh, a flat surface so it behaves more like a baffle than you get with the, perhaps the harp coils. Anyway, vertical plate coils, not as common. I haven't dealt a lot with them, but they are out there. And so we will include them in this discussion. Okay, just by way of discussion on the left, I'm showing the profile of a mixing vessel that has helical coils. On the right, you'll see the circular cross section of individual tubes in those coils. And there's obviously only one set of coils. On the left side of the tank, there are two sets. We obviously wouldn't have both. One side uh, 
and two quills on the other side. You'd have one or the other. But you can see how you could nest a second coil inside of the first to give you that design. Then you see the impeller somewhere in the middle of those coils. Uh, the helical coils are attached to the baffles in this case, as you can see. Uh, and you also, I'll just mention briefly, you need to leave clearance behind those coils, uh, below the coils even, so that you have clearance enough for your fluid to flow as the impeller tries to pump it. You don't want to put pinch points into these coils because that will cause impact on your uh, overall heat transfer. Then on the right, we show up a picture now looking down from the top in the vertical coil design. If you look at the 12 o'clock and the 9 o'clock positions, those are plate coils. At the 12 o'clock position, the plate coil is a smaller diameter than is the difference between impeller radius and tank radius. And so uh, it can sit perpendicular to the wall, still have clearance with the impeller. And the 9 o'clock position is a plate coil that is wider than that clearance between impeller and wall. So it has to be angled. In this case, it's angled at a 45 degree angle. If you look at the three o'clock and the six o'clock positions in this image, you can see that uh, these now are harp coils. You can see the cross section for individual tubes. In three o'clock position, six tubes wider than the clearance between impeller and wall, so it has to be angled. At the six o'clock position, five tubes, they can be perpendicular to the wall because they give you enough clearance. So there is some, some uh, flexibility there. I will mention that uh, tube bundle effectiveness is typically less than the coiled plates effectiveness. And if you had six bundles dispersed around the perimeter of your tank, that generally provides about, say, 75% the effectiveness, the baffling effectiveness as you would achieve with four standard baffles. So harp coils will give you some coil, or excuse me, some baffling effect, but it may not be as effective as a full standard baffle set. Hey, let me mention two sources for heat transfer correlations and information related thereto within stirred vessels. These sources are the Handbook of Industrial Mixing and the Advances in Industrial Mixing. These two books were published by the North American Mixing Forum, or NAMF, uh, the, the organization where I've been treasurer for the last decade. Uh, these are written by experts in the mixing field, multiple chapters, and each expert was asked to address the area of uh, his specialty. And obviously, um, you can see the last, the advances was published in 2015. So it has a good set of references to technical journals and articles that are good up to that date. So again, a couple of good references to consider for heat transfer design in stirred tanks. Now, just mention briefly, if you were going to collect your own data with your own system and you wanted to characterize the heat transfer systems, what would you need to know? This shows you have a process fluid and a heat transfer fluid. You need to know some specific properties, variables related to each. So if you look about, or if we focus first on the process fluid, you need to know the volume and the wall surface area of that fluid and uh, the tank. You need to know thermal physical properties of that fluid, uh, density, viscosity, heat capacity, thermal conductivity, et cetera. You need to have temperature measurements within the fluid, and we would recommend more than a single location, perhaps two or more if you can. You want to try and establish uniform temperature throughout that fluid. You need to know your impeller size, type, and location, and you need to know the controlled mixing speed Hopefully your measuring power have teared that power and can get, based on uh, work, for example, you might get your power calculation, but you wanna have a, a measure of power so you know how much is going into the system. From the heat transfer fluid perspective, you need to know its volume and its wall surface area, be it jackets or coils. You need to know the thermal physical properties of that heat transfer fluid, same properties we mentioned previously for the process fluid. You need to know an inlet and an outlet temperature as that fluid uh, goes into or out of the, the jacket itself or the coils. And I put a note here. I, I'll just say on the right side, I've got the equations, the mathematical expressions for heat transfer. Uh, and you can see for a batch of volume of your process fluid, the Q, the heat transfer would be a function of M, which is the mass of fluid present times C sub P, the heat transfer, or excuse me, heat capacity of that fluid, 
times the temperature change that you affected. And below is the correlation for convective heat transfer with H0A, the, the convective heat transfer coefficient, the area, wall area or heat transfer area, and then the change in temperature. For the flowing fluid, the heat transfer fluid, this now is, it's not a batch process, it's a, this is flowing. So instead of, of having just a, a fixed mass of material, you could say, well, I've got a volumetric flow rate times the density, that'll give me a mass flow rate times C sub P delta T, as we had in the previous expression for the process fluid. The convective heat transfer coefficient or the, the convective equation of heat transfer looks very similar to above. But I'm noting down at the bottom that um, one of these processes is a batch mode, one is a transient mode or flow mode. And so you need to make sure that you account for both of those. And you could say, well, let me know the volume of my heat transfer jacket or heat transfer coils. If I know that volume and I know the volumetric flow rate, I know the residence time within the coil. And if I know the residence time and I know the temperatures in and out, I can back out the mass of material that was present and in times heat capacity and delta T, that gives me my, my, my uh, heat transfer. I just have to mention, though, that that builds in the assumption that the residence time inside of that jacket or those coils were necessary to achieve the exit temperature. Now, that could be true. It's also possible that you could hit final temperature earlier in the, the process, and then that heat transfer fluid continues to flow and doesn't change temperature much at all because it's already come to a, a maximum. Point being, you could overestimate um, how effectively you're transferring the heat in. I, I say that you would, I guess if it, anyway, there's transient issues here where you would overestimate how effective the heat transfer is and you actually get faster transfer, but then you have dead space where no, have, no heat transfer occurs as the fluid continues to, to move through your heat transfer jacket or foil. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's something you need to be aware of in, in such assumptions. Okay, now I wanna look at the equation. I'm actually going to jump into equations. So this is the equation to look at heat transfer through the jackets or tank. There is a correlation shown in the rectangle. It says one over U naught. What is U naught? That is an overall heat transfer coefficient as indicated in the equation on the left, just below the slide title. Q is equal to U naught A naught times delta T log mean. So that U naught is an overall heat transfer coefficient. It is a function of the contributions of uh, the various layers in this tank geometry, this tank formulation, and those are depicted within the rectangle. You see the two dotted lines in the page. The line to the right is the inside surface of your heat transfer tank or, or coil, jacket or coil. The left line is the outside surface. So the distance between them is the tank thickness. If you look then at the small 2D cross-sectional areas, I'm looking at a side profile in the middle of the rectangle, we have the tank jacket there in the middle, and immediately to the left of that tank jacket is a fouling layer. And immediately to the fouling layer is the boundary layer of the flowing fluid. So process fluid, if this were coils, it would be uh, the heat transfer fluid if we're talking about the jacket. To the right of that dotted line and the associated uh, tank wall, you have a lining layer. If Think of a glass lined or a Teflon lined tank, there's a lining layer. Then to the right of that, you have a fouling layer, and to the right of that is the flowing fluid. The, in this case, the boundary layer would be for, if it's coils, that would be your, your heat transfer fluid. If it's jacket, it's the process fluid. So each of those individual layers in a composite analysis approach to heat transfer, you add up their resistances as indicated in this correlation. So you see that U naught is a function of that resistance due to convective heat transfer on the, the uh, I'm saying HI, so that'd be the internal fluid. Then you have a fouling factor for the internal, then you have a wall thickness and thermal conductivity for the tank wall, similar term for the lining, and a fouling factor for 
the uh, outer fluid and one over H naught for the outer fluid. Adding those together gives you your overall heat transfer coefficient. Now here's a key point. Highlighted in green, I see the two convective heat transfer coefficients and the two fouling factors. Those are the values that we don't know in this correlation. We know the other values. So how do we get those convective heat transfer coefficients? How do we get the fouling factors? There are correlations for calculating the convective heat transfer coefficients in a stirred tank, and that's what we will talk about next. Fouling factors you can think of, um, I guess, very typically, they'll give you a, a common fouling factor in a table. Or if you want to treat it as a layer that has uh, heat conduction through it, you would need to know a thickness and a thermal conductivity for the fouling factor. Maybe you can get that material or that information. But either way, you, you need to come up with fouling factors. You may assume it's zero on, on one surface. Um, anyway, that's now the correlation that will help us determine overall heat transfer in these surfaces. Let's drill a little bit deeper now on these correlations. And I will just say, as we discuss these various convective heat transfer coefficient correlations for stirred tanks, I don't expect you to memorize, don't expect you to try and remember. I want you to notice some generalities. I want you to notice that the correlation is a function of a Reynolds number raised to some power, a Prandtl number raised to some power. Then there will be fluid properties typically raised to a power, and there will be geometry terms raised to some power. So your convective heat transfer correlations, regardless of what type of, type of heat transfer surface we're talking about, regardless of whether we're talking about the heat transfer fluid or the process fluid, the correlations are going to have this general shape in almost all cases. So that's what I'd like you to memorize. That's what I'll, excuse me, not memorize, recognize and use as we continue our discussion. So I'll start with calculating or determining the heat transfer coefficient in a jacket. I've shown an image up in the top right that depicts a jacket. I've put blue coloring in the jacket itself to say the fluid that this correlation applies to is the fluid flowing in the jacket, not the fluid in the vessel itself, not the process fluid. So here's the correlation in the, in the rectangle. You can see that it is indeed a function of Reynolds and Prandtl numbers raised to appropriate powers. There's a ratio of viscosities, the bulk phase or wall raised to some power, and there's a geometric term. In this particular correlation, we have said half pipes can have a 180 degree or a 120 degree cross section. The numbers or the, the correlation differs slightly depending on which of those half pipe profiles you have, but that's reflected here in this system. Okay, so this is a correlation for a half pipe. If we jump now to the correlation for a dimple jacket, this is the form I want you to notice as well. Right off the bat, notice that this applies to the Reynolds number range of 1,000 to 50,000. So indeed, this is for turbulent flows in a dimple jacket. The correlation is a function of, you see geometry terms with uh, areas and dimensions, separation between dimples, etc. Reynolds and Prandtl raised to appropriate powers. So again, the general form that we said would be important here. And if the vessel, uh, if the dimple jacket geometry changes, that would be reflected in the values that you would plug in for these different terms in this convective heat transfer equation. All right, so now this is for two different jacket types. What about the process fluid that is flowing inside of these jackets? That's depicted here. You can see the, the blue fluid is in the inside of the vessel itself. Here's the correlation. It's for Reynolds numbers greater than 100. Again, Reynolds and Prandtl raised to appropriate powers. There are viscosity ratio as well as geometric terms. Notice that this is for three different types of impellers, a Lightning A310, a Lightning A200, or a Lightning R100. Notice as well that it's not just three different impellers, but it could be, it actually looks at different heat transfer areas. Uh, one is for the jacket being just around the wall. The other is for the jacket being just at the bottom of the vessel. And of course, you can use both, and then you would add the terms attributed to these two. 
But this particular correlation shows the sensitivity to impeller type and jacket type. That may give you more accuracy, a greater precision, and et cetera, uh, than if you had a general correlation that fit for all impellers and all jacket types. We'll we'll talk about that more later. All right now, here's a general correlation that fits for the see the first correlation said it's for turbines only. So when I talked about the A100, the R100, the A310 in the previous slide, those are all hydrofoils or a, a disc gas disperser. They would fit in the turbine class. So all three of those impeller types would fit to this single expression, which has Reynolds and Prandtl raised to appropriate powers. The second correlation, though, below that first is for turbines, anchors, gate impellers, fogler impellers. This seems to say, let's find a general expression that works for all impellers. So it, it too has a Prandtl number raised to some power. It does not have a Reynolds number, interestingly enough. But you can see it does have physical properties of the fluids, um, and they're raised to appropriate powers. I would just say uh, this being a more general correlation, not impeller specific, or at least less so than the previous correlations, I would not expect to get as good at accuracy or precision with this correlation. However, it is a more general correlation. And so maybe it's good enough to give me what I need for the heat transfer calculations I'm doing. Anyway, just know there are different levels of sophistication and therefore accuracy or precision in the correlations that are available to us. Uh, last point, this is for Reynolds between 12 and 46,000. So it starts down in the low range, low flows up to uh, turbulent flows. Okay, let's look at a correlation for this is the process fluid now for coils. This is for helical coils. And notice again, Reynolds Prandtl to some power, geometry terms, physical property of the fluid terms. Same general form. Reynolds number is greater than 100. Let's look at another now for the process fluid inside of the vessel if we had harp coils, vertical coils. Correlation again, Reynolds and Prandtl raised to some power. You can see. Uh, geometry terms and also that viscosity ratio. So the same general shape we've talked about in the past. I don't see a specification here for an appropriate Reynolds number. I couldn't find it in the reference, but thus I don't list it here. But uh, again, you want to make sure that your flow regime fits the correlation that you're trying to use. Okay, now let's look at the fluid flowing through the coils themselves, be they vertical, or helical, horizontal, near horizontal. And what you notice, I mean, it might be easy to say, well, what does the fluid care what type of coil it's flowing through? It should be the same correlation for both orientations. Yes, but no. You can see that it is a very similar correlation for both cases, but the helical coils adds an additional geometry term to account for that near horizontal orientation. But it's still the same general shape, Reynolds, Brandles, uh, viscosity ratio, a geometry term. Notice there is no geometry term for the vertical coils. Okay, just a, just a, okay, an interesting note applicable to, to these correlations. All right, so now that's talked about the correlations. Let me move on and talk about something other than the correlations, the other considerations in heat transfer in stirred tanks. I'm showing here some images that are computational fluid dynamics or CFD simulations of a helical coil inside of a tank. It's the same tank, same fluid fill level in each. However, the diameter of the helical coil is different within these three examples. To the left is a very large helical coil, too big to allow any baffles on the outside. In the middle is one that has a slightly smaller coil diameter, and baffles are on the inside, half width baffles. The same, checking to make sure I'm right. Sorry, half width, but outside of the coils. And then the rightmost image is yet a smaller diameter to the helical coils with full width baffles on the outside. You'll notice that uh, listed is 10% of the area is outside of the coils in the leftmost image, 25% of the area outside in the middle, 39% outside on the 
rightmost image. And there's a difference in the flow that you see. This is looking at uh, velocities in the tank on the left side with very little clearance between coil and wall. You don't get any flow moving up the wall. This is running with a down pumping impeller, an A510, so a hydrofoil. It's at a Reynolds number of 4,000. You're just not getting return flow up the wall. That coil is choking or limiting your flow. And so you're not getting good fluid flow. You're not getting good heat transfer. When you go to a little more clearance between coil and wall, you're starting to see good flow there, but it's even better flow in the rightmost image. And so that would be the geometry, of course, that we would recommend to be used. And I mentioned previously, it's also important to have clearance between the bottom of the coils and the bottom of the vessel. You don't want to slam those coils all the way down against the bottom of the vessel. Same choking issues. Let's look as well at liquid viscosity. These are CFD animations for two different cases where you have a liquid viscosity of 1,000 centipoise. Let me start that CFD case. We release particles between the baffle and the wall, and we watch the flow carry those particles and distribute them throughout the tank. And it looks like we're getting good distribution. Um, I'll just leave it at that. It looks like a good distribution. The image at the right side of this left rectangle shows what the final view would be at the end of, of the simulation. Now let's do one, excuse me, 10,000 centipoise. So an order of magnitude more viscous. Look how slow the particles move. They obviously take a lot more time to mix in. So viscosity is impacting flow. Your Reynolds number would be much lower. And with a lower Reynolds number, maybe you have to use a different correlation for these coils. But even if you didn't, if you still had the same flow regime as in the lower viscosity case, you're going to get lower heat transfer rates because of the lower flows. Okay, I will, I will stop that. But you can see viscosity has an impact. You need to design your heat transfer system accordingly. Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. This now is looking at the impellers themselves. You can use different impellers. On the left is an image of a tank that had a, a anchor type impeller at the bottom. And then above that was a baffled region that has two two-bladed 45-degree pitched blades on it. And this is the heat transfer that we achieved with a hot wall. And after 65 seconds of flow, you can see that we still have, there's higher temperature at the wall and the temperature drops as we move in toward the center line. We still have a cold region right at the center line in the lower of the two impellers. And I guess it's even cold up by the top impeller, the two two-bladed pitch blades. We've got a good hot zone maybe in this region, close proximity to that anchor impeller, but it's not propagating the flow well. If we take that exact same tank and that exact same loan and excuse me, load of processed fluid and we put in three hydrofoils, appropriate diameters, maintain the same baffling. But notice, this is the exact same temperature, ran it again for 65 seconds. Notice the uniformity in the temperature throughout the entire tank because we get good uniform flow through the tank. Again, this doesn't have coils, but it's a jacketed vessel. And having the right impellers appropriately positioned and running the appropriate conditions, you get much better heat transfer and struggling with a system that is not properly designed. Finally, I'll just one final comment about uh, plate coils. This shows plate coils that are in a tank. Thing I want to mention is the the um, in this case changing the rotation from clockwise to counterclockwise. So we went from you could be an up pumper or a down pumper. I'll just mention in the handbooks it is said that you should run your case so that the impeller rotation pumps the fluid from the inside center line toward the wall. You should not run it so that it draws fluid from the wall into the center line. I can't say I have a lot of experience with plate coils to say, yes, I've seen that difference. I, I haven't uh, looked at a case where we have compared the two flows, but per handbook recommendation, you would want to pump from center line to the walls for your best heat transfer with a plate coil. I'll leave it at that.
Moving on, I want to show one more thing. Now, this is actual data that we collected here in the system shown in the images on the right. We had water inside of a dimple jacketed vessel. We looked at three different impellers, an A310, which is a narrow blade hydrofoil, an A200, which is a pitched blade, four of them pitched at 45 degrees, and an R100, which is commonly called a Rushton, or it's a disc uh, with six flat blades on that disc. We looked at them and the heat transfer that they transferred in either just a side jacket or a bottom jacket or the combination side and bottom in the data shown on the right. What I want to point out immediately is that the difference between jacket type, here is just the bottom, here is just the wall, jacket type has a much bigger impact on the heat transfer than does impeller type. The different shapes, square, circle, or triangle, represent the different impellers. And they do make a difference, but nowhere near the dramatic difference of the jacket type. So note that. Note its significance. Uh, I guess for the sake of time, I'll leave it at that and move on. These are just finally some design considerations when talking about uh, doing heat transfer in a stirred tank. You want to maximize flow over your heat transfer area, and obviously you want to maximize the area itself. If you have open impellers in turbulent flow, turns out that the impeller impact we would call secondary. Think of that last slide. The, the area available to your jacket or your coils was much more significant than the impeller type for your heat transfer. Also, we looked at a case before that where we had viscosity issues. And we talked about the gap, the clearance between the impeller and your coils or your wall. Those factors could be a more or are a more primary consideration than, again, impeller type specifically when you're in a laminar flow case. OK, let's look again. If we go across to the right side of the page, here's a correlation that's looking at the convective heat transfer coefficient as a function of this epsilon is power per volume. D over T ratio is the blade or impeller diameter versus tank diameter. Right off the bat, you see this 2 ninths power exponent. That 2 ninths power says that if I want to double my convective heat transfer coefficient by increasing my power per unit volume, how much do I have to increase it to get a doubling of H? 23 times. That that's not realistic to think that you're going to double your H by increasing your power input by 23 times. Similarly, if you want to increase or double the H by increasing your impeller diameter, you would have to increase it by 23 times. Again, not very realistic. So the impeller size itself or the impeller power input is probably not a primary effect, but a secondary effect to your heat transfer. Notice down below. Staying on the right side, we're comparing the thermal effectiveness of a jacket to, to tubes. A jacket, if it has an effectiveness of one, the internal coils, vertical or helical, would be one and a half. So having flow on both sides of the coils gives you greater effectiveness than, than having flow just on the outside, the jacket. And plate coils, they give you an effectiveness of 1.1, so a 10% increase. And lastly, I'll step over here to the bottom on the left. Um, if you're running a cooling application versus a heating application, interesting to note, the handbooks note that the transfer coefficient that you calculate for cooling, you'd use the exact same correlations, but you would only get 65% of the effectiveness with a cooling situation as opposed to heating. And, and finally, if you have multiple helical coils, we talked about that application. If you have multiple helical coils, putting a second set of coils inside of your initial set, it will give you higher area for higher heat transfer, but the effectiveness of that outer set goes down. In this case, handbooks say you use about 80% effectiveness for the outer coil once you put the inner coil in place. So you have to account for the impact on the flow that reaches that outer coil. All right, finally, I want to mention that the services that we provide here at SPX Flow, we will provide, if you contacted us for help with your heat transfer issues, 
we would use an application engineer if it's more run-of-the-mill standard determining a process side heat transfer coefficient or characterize existing surface area or or determine the the cooling time or the heating time but if you want something more specialized like cfd analysis or more advanced coil designs that would go to process consultants or the r d the lab work uh, as opposed to applications engineers that would involve me and my colleagues in in a more complicated advanced manner and we would provide the services that that would help you solve your problems in terms of heat transfer and i should note too at the bottom for mechanical design and actual manufacture of those heat transfer surfaces we do not provide that of course it's the tank supplier who provides those the mechanical analysis and the construction for your heat transfer surfaces to summarize to conclude coil and jacket types differ in effectiveness and in cost the general impact of the heat transfer surface area we saw was a much more significant impact than was impeller diameter or other impeller parameters including power input the heat transfer correlations are available in the literature and they share a very common form it's important that you know the flow regime you're operating in and choose the appropriate correlation accordingly and and also there are other um, design or performance sensitivities that you want to be aware of and and uh, consider as you're doing your designs and finally cfd and lab experiments do offer good understanding enhanced understanding it's better not to just trust cfd alone without validating it to some extent cfd though will give you some understanding that experiments don't but experiments give you realized systems with real friction factors or fouling or other impacts. So experiments are extremely important. Thank you for your time. Um, I would now be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'll, I'll just jump off with, I see a, a uh, comment here. A question you showed a correlation to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient for three different impeller types was that correlation developed for any other specific impeller types i need to comment here that uh, the correlations are actually developed for impeller classes if you will so hydrofoils that would be the hydrofoil offered by lightning or philadelphia mixers or somebody else uh, you know, whomever. And then similarly with the disc turbine, we have a Rushton, but perhaps that's the best you have. So you'd use that as well for a CD6 or a, a Smith turbine or whatever you want to call that, the R130 and the lightning terminology. So I hope that helps. The correlations then are general classes of impellers, not a specific impeller. And they try to give enough variety to let you decide which would best, best fit your application. I see another question here asking, it's quite a complex question about. Uh, Greetings, have you ever, have you had any experience with finding the heat transfer coefficient during phase change and more complex conditions? And then talks about conditions in a bachelor's thesis. And, and I guess I would just say, this sounds like a much more complex issue than I have looked at specifically. Uh, again, you'd be well, welcome, Frank Rasek. Uh, you'd be welcome to contact me. We'd talk more after if there's something that we need to go into in greater depth. I see a question from Brian. Uh, Hi, thanks for the session. How do you look to validate the turbulent flow in the tank jacket? Uh, good question. I mean, again, you can calculate your, your flow rate and then you would need to have some term of diameter, be that the hydraulic diameter or any correlations will tell you what diameter they're based on, but pick the appropriate characteristic, characteristic diameter, excuse me, or your length term and then calculate the Reynolds number and see if it does indeed show that you're turbulent. Beyond that, I guess I don't know what to tell you offhand. I'd have to think about it more, see if there are some other. Uh, any other questions that uh, anybody might have? Looks like we've got just a few minutes yet. I will say as well, I mean, while I take or have a minute, let me just mention, Many of these slides that I showed today were not created by me for this particular seminar, but I had colleagues at SPX Flow who created some of these, uh, Rich Keen, Aaron Strand, uh, Nicole Cordemanche. They prepared slides for presentations that they gave previously, and I 
use some of those slides. Would like to acknowledge their help in in putting his presentation together. Okay, looks like there may be uh, other questions that have come in. What is the best way to heat and cool a fermenter as efficient as a plate and frame heat exchanger or tubular? I guess the point, again, with the fermenters, it, it obviously matters if cleaning is a big issue. Um, we were just talking with people last week in pharma who said in a pharmaceutical fermenter, we're never going to put coils inside. We're going to rely on the jacket only. Uh, and so again, depends on can you put internal coils inside or can you not? If you can, you'll get better heat exchange than if you use a jacket only. Um, jacket types, et cetera, you can pick the one that seems to work best. Again, dimple jacket seems to get very good ratings, be a good good uh, choice for, for that use. But again, I guess we could pursue this further if you wanted to ask more specific questions. Okay, another question, any role of Froud number in heat exchange? Good question. I mean, the Froud number is, you're looking at the ratio of a, a kind of a tangential inertia versus gravity. I guess in, in a tank, I mean, I guess just offhand, I can't say that the Froud number is going to have a, a direct impact on this given correlation. But, you know, something worth looking at. Again, Reynolds and Prandtl are the dimensional numbers that are used in most correlations. So they apparently seem to be the most important for what we're dealing with. Um, Anyway, hope that answers. Hope that hope that's helpful at least. Okay, looking for any other questions. All right. Uh, yeah, and, and I've also been asked if there's a possibility to expand on any of the previous questions that were asked. Um, yeah, I have to pick one here that. Uh, how efficient are magnetic impellers? Okay, a good question, not related specifically to heat transfer per se, but I mean, the magnet, they do not mix as effectively. I can't quantify specifically for you, except to say that we have done comparisons, uh, CFD and experiments where we have shown that, for example, in a dissolution setting, overhead impellers could be, uh, well, in our case, it wasn't a full order of magnitude more effective, but slightly less than say half of that. So the mag impellers do work. Um, maybe they're not as fast or efficient as is that overhead impeller with you know, uh, hydrofoils, for example, but it may be good enough to get you by. And if it's avoiding cleaning issues, uh, you know, maybe that's something that you have to go to. So if you said, how well does it work on the, uh, on a jacket and a heat exchanger. Again, I haven't measured that. I haven't tried to predict that, but I guess I would just say probably not as effective as open impellers, especially if you have multiple impellers. But if that's what you have to live with, that's what you have to live with. So, you know, there are cases where the mag drive is recommended. All right, uh, here's another question about copy of the presentation. I think Kristen Riggs from our, uh, Corporate marketing has indicated that this presentation will be made available. There will be surveys and questions asked. We would ask for your feedback. But yes, you will have a copy of the, the recording of this presentation made available to you. There is about a five minute break yet. Let's see if I'm missing some questions. I tried to calculate the heat transfer coefficient in a nine inch. Sorry, nine foot diameter tank found five correlations. Okay, AI, uh, this, this question has been asked, how do I pick the best correlation and shows variation from 180 to 300 BTU per hour foot squared degree F? Uh, the only way to really know which is better is to either do experimental measurements that allow you to compare or to talk to somebody else who has done that. I mean, this is a good question. What correlation do you use? And of course, the conservative approach is always to say, take the an answer that you believe you trust, and if you know, try and pick a conservative value so that if anything, you could achieve better heat transfer than what you're accounting for. I, again, there's not a real easy answer to that question. I think uh, if you can run experiments to validate 
what you're going to use. That is absolutely the best way to do it. Have you done testing to ensure turbulence would be? Uh, I guess this is again just to follow up to the turbulence. Question being, have I done turbulent or have I done testing to ensure turbulence? Um, what I have done in jackets, for example, would be the same in the coils, but you could measure your, your flow rate, your quantitative flow rate in and out of the jacket or the coil. And based on that flow rate, you can, and again, the, the appropriate characteristic uh, length dimension, you can calculate a Reynolds number to see if it does indeed fall within the, the turbulent flow regime. I haven't done more than that, I'll have to say. I haven't done beyond that. Okay, looking for other questions. Uh, Thank you for these good questions. Okay, here's one. In the heat atlas published by Springer Fairlock is a useful reference for heat transfer correlations in stirred tanks. Okay, I guess this is just a, looks like this is from Dewey in part N, section three, page 1451 FF in the heat atlas. So there's a reference with questions or with an answer, I guess. Useful references for heat transfer correlations in stirred tanks. Okay, good to know. Thank you, Dewey. I think there's a lot out there in the literature. And, and that's why, again, I would say, you know, if you have the ability to do some screening, maybe you will want to do some experimental testing to see what you are most comfortable with. If, if you need to be you know, more accurate than just take a two or three possible options and choose one. Here's a question. How do you minimize wobble on an impeller not anchored to the bottom with a tripod? Okay, I think he's asking about a steady bearing. Again. Uh, this is from Narayan Suresh. Uh, you could contact us after and we could talk more about options, um, steady bearings, limit rings. You can also put rings on the impellers themselves, uh, the other things that we could talk about. So we invite you to, to contact. In general, is it cost effective to change retrofit tanks with inefficient heating designs for a more effective design? Ah, boy, that's a good question. General, it's cost effective to change your retrofit tanks with inefficient designs for more effective. I guess I'd have to leave that to, to you to make the decision of whether or not it is cost effective. Again, I can tell you, as noted in the presentation, internal coils have higher effectiveness than does just the jacket. Um, you would need to do analyses to see if one or the other is sufficient uh, to, to quote unquote be a moneymaker for you. Please contact me if you, you want to explore that further. Uh, yeah, and again, for the clarification from Narayan Suresh, he's worried about seal destruction with a wobbly shaft. Yeah, contact us. We could, we could uh, steer you in the right direction or help you get answers to that. All right, let's see. Where are we at on time? I'm less than a minute left. So I guess I don't know. I don't see any other messages that are here, but I want to thank everyone once again for your participation today. Please follow through with the survey and we would love to hear from you. Clarify in any way possible. Feel free to contact us in that regard. Thanks and, and have a good day.